Thank you very much. So in this lecture I want to explore the relationship of archaeological investigation with society and to note how it is procured and ask how we could do it better. What is archaeology for? Who wants it? And what for? Is it an academic quest, an educational skill, a leisure activity or a profitable enterprise for treasure hunters? And which of these uh, could be classed as the activities of an elite? Can we expect to be inclusive with such a wide range of interests? Well, it won't amaze you uh, to find that I bring my own prejudices to this matter, and to prevent you from laboring under any delusion that I'm about to present a balanced view, <laughs> let, let, let me say that I intend to speak in favor of archaeology as primarily, primarily undertaken by a creative profession with a life-enhancing mission. We're like architects, not cheerleaders or, or planners. Architects also teach, research, and make themselves useful to the community. But their greatest moments are when they get to put up a building. That's us, too. Our greatest moment is when we put a project on the ground and recreate a lost piece of the past. Now, I'm going to start uh, by telling three stories. Um, e each is intended to illustrate a popular view of what it is that archaeology is for. And they range in time from 70s through to last year. Wood Quay in Dublin is, is a site where the incoming Vikings had built a shanty town and a waterfront in the 10th century and developed it in the Middle Ages. It was on the banks of the Liffey and had preserved its timber houses and jetties and boat parts and light industries very well indeed. The site was purchased in 1974 by Dublin Corporation who planned to build themselves a fine new headquarters there. Having cleared the site they invited the National Museum of Ireland to carry out some excavations. By 1976, the NMI had run out of money, which suited the corporation very well, since they were anxious to get on with putting up their building. But the site was soon championed by the Friends of Medieval Dublin, who campaigned for more excavation and for the conservation of earthworks that could still be seen. Their secret weapon was Xavier Martin, a Jesuit priest who took the campaign to the courts in Ireland and Europe, protected from financial penalty by the convenient measure of having taken a vow of poverty. <laughs> <laughs> the site was declared a national monument, 1978. But strangely, that only gave it another six weeks of excavation. So 20,000 people took to the streets to have it extended. In March 1979, a second injunction from Father Martin failed, and the bulldozers moved in that day. Now, this celebrated case is a, is a useful one, since it shows something of what citizens want from archaeology. They weren't conservationist. They wanted the site dug, not conserved. It wasn't nationalist. People being dug up were not Celts, but Norwegians. What this population of Dubliners wanted was good quality research. Research that took as long as it took and told us what it told us. They were campaigning uh, for the right to know. Now let's go to New York and to Manhattan, and to 290 Broadway. <coughs> in this case, another large government body, the General Services Agency, planned to build a headquarters for, of all things, 
the Federal Environmental Impact Office. <laughs> <laughs> they commissioned an impact statement using the archaeological contractor HCI. HCI noted the former presence on an 18th century map of a Negro burial ground, which is arrowed here. And you might think this would set the old alarm bell ringing. However, they decided that not a lot would be left, so GSA said thanks and proceeded to dig for foundations. They didn't need planning permission, being the government, and they didn't consult the people of Harlem because, quote, the site wasn't in Harlem. It's about 100 metres away, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Very shortly, the builders hit human remains and were spotted attempting to spirit them off the site in skips. The word got out, and the local newspaper, Greenwich's Village Voice, had a field day. The mayor of New York, David Dinkins, who coincidentally is a member of the African American community, came down to look and demanded to be shown, wait for it, the archaeological project design. There wasn't one. And this led to the famous aphorism that appeared in the Village Voice, quote, Doing archaeology without a design is like driving a bus without a steering wheel. This is from the mayor of New York, not from an archaeologist, I may say. The archaeology was stopped, and the archaeological contractors were replaced. Excavations were completed in 1992. Respect was shown, shrines, exhibitions, and it resulted in a tremendous exposure, emotion and sympathy for the plight of the New York slaves of 200 years before. But that wasn't quite the end. In an article entitled Black Bones versus White Science, Village Voice described the tug of war between rivals for the post excavation contract. The new contractors had their contemporary offices in the basement of the World Trade Center. Their records were pillaged there by the old contractors in a lunchtime raid. Now, this is, this is, this is, uh, you know, commercial competition between units. Take note. <laughs> it's feisty. No, no long letters to people. Just to see, bring a truck up you know, to the World Trade Center into the basement. Bang. In the end, the project, its records were handed over to Michael Blakey of Howard University, who knows a strong African American center. Well, I spoke to Michael on a visit to the site in 1993 and heard about the scientific analysis he was going to apply to study the, the diaspora, how people had arrived from Africa in the 18th century as slaves, where from, their state of health, whether it got better or worse, how they practiced African forms of worship, in brief, the whole story. The site itself became a national landmark and a memorial in honor of some of New York's most significant but underdocumented citizens. Well, the moral here is that people care about the way the past is used, but they don't need to have an axe to grind. As in Dublin, the popular demand here was for good research, and research in which the modern social context was acknowledged and respected. They wanted to see what was proposed in advance in a project design, i.e. not just what sort of building was going to go up, but how it was proposed to handle the historical roots of the site. My third example is from Cambodia, a country where they really know how to loot. There are laws against it, of course, but, and some of them are very strict. Those in China have included the death penalty. But they are not effective because people are poor and sites are remote, and above all, because there are dealers everywhere. Members of the University of Phnom Penh, who were conducting surveys of Iron Age sites, have noted extensive looting in 2006 at the appropriately named village of Bit Mass, which is roughly translated means gold plated. The next year, they encountered looters in action at Prohir. That's 2007. Students Vin Lechor and Seng Sinatra sent an emotional email to their former German professor in Germany, 
who in turn contacted Andreas Reinecke, an active German academic and field worker. For the next nine months, Reinecke raised money and got permissions to excavate the Iron Age cemetery scientifically. During this time, the villagers had continued their digging. They reduced an area as big as two football pitches to a battlefield of craters. It produced a mass of gold and at least 20 Dong Son drums, which you see on the top right, right there. And all this was sold as scrap metal at the going rate of 20 US cents a kilo. And then the material was laundered by the dealers at profits of many hundreds of times that figure. When the team arrived, when Andreas Reinecke's team arrived in February 2008, new houses uh, had gone up everywhere in the village, thanks to the villagers' newfound wealth. Nothing was left of the cemetery except for what was still under the road leading to the village. And this was the area that Reinecke got permission to dig. The villagers wanted to dig that too for themselves and were reluctant to accept the concept that the past was not going to profit them. But they did, of course, eventually get a new road. Something, I suppose. The first task was us to persuade the community that archaeological investigation was a new, better way of proceeding. And this wasn't as easy as you might think. In the picture there, you see one of their meetings with an interpreter trying to explain what was going to happen. From then on, the pro here story is really uplifting. Once they knew there was nothing to fear, the previous so-called specialists, in other words, the people who knew how to find the tombs, came forward one by one to share their considerable knowledge with the new German-led team, their knowledge about how to find the graves and what was in them. The star digger was villager Kong Sung, who had been already credited with, with seven drums and had bought himself a water buffalo with the proceedings. Although 50% of the archaeology under the road had already been done, they dug it by uh, going down in the cemetery and then tunnelling sideways. So they dug the graves sideways from under the road. Um, but the rest of it was there, and Reinecke gradually impressed the local community and the visitors by what he did, his, the, the great care that he took the reverence that he showed for, for the objects and all the objects and different kinds of objects. Then he uh, introduced to the village a lot of visitors, and we've all done this, and it has a great effect. I'm sure you realise that uh, when you bring a sort of VIP in from somewhere else, local people begin to realise that the value extends a lot further than the locality. He then also published very swiftly a beautiful book, the bottom right hand corner shows the cover. This book not only tells the story, which is where I got my facts from, so he didn't pull any punches, explained exactly what had happened. But then he also explained what they did, what the scientific <coughs> analysis showed, how the scientific analysis worked, what it's all for, why it matters. In brief, he not only won the opportunity to do research, he won the hearts and minds of the looters, and in effect, he won the argument. Now, these cases all endorse the general idea, the will, uh, that exists in most countries for the preservation of, of the past and, and the demand that it should be exploited only for public benefit, generally used under the rubric of heritage. All the countries concerned had heritage legislation, and this was based to various degrees in the idea that the past was property, and state property in, in particular. Clearly such legislation had failed where Reinecke's argument succeeded. In the first two cases, the loss of property was not what had got the protesters onto the streets. 
they didn't demand the preservation of a nationally important monument. On the contrary, they demanded the excavation of the sites in question, but only if done in the name of science. They were demanding an excavation and a piece of research as the alternative to throwing it away. They were not inclined to regard an archaeological site as property at all, but as a source of knowledge, and that knowledge was the entitlement of everybody. In the third case, the response to looting at Prohere was not to shoot the looters, or to congratulate them on their good fortune and generate mindless publicity about it, as we do with the Staffordshire Hall in England. It was to bring them into the professional team and encourage them to think about what they had lost in exchange for a kilo of scrap metal. Note also that for the public, the besetting sin of the archaeologists as well as the government was an inability to predict what was there and plan for it. David Dinkins, black mayor of New York, did not object to the excavation of the slave cemetery, provided it was done with respect. He objected to the fact that there was no published project design. And insofar as there was a plan, it hadn't consulted the people of Harlem. A project design that can therefore never be complete unless it takes account of the social context of the project. And it's the social context is what concerns us in this lecture. If governments represent and control people, which is presumably what they're for, the ambience they create for archaeology depends on what they think that is for. Some see it purely as a recreation, like angling. Perhaps there needs to be a bit of conservation, otherwise fish stocks in rivers will run out. But on the whole, this is a leisure activity that regulates itself. I would call this type of regime unregulated. It is how Britain was before Pitt Rivers came along. Other governments see archaeology as an important activity with results that belong to the nation as a whole. The government is the custodian of the soul of the nation and the principal funder of research in the historical sciences. This kind of regime is regulated. All archaeology is looked after and done by the government or carried out on its behalf by agencies, the universities and academies of science. Everything, including rescue, is paid for by taxes. This has been the principal mode in Eastern Europe and to some extent in Western Europe too. It is still longed for nostalgically <coughs> in France and in Scandinavia. The third kind of regime is the one familiar in the UK and in the United States of America. It is partially regulated, but delegates most of the doing of archaeology to the private sector. It is generally administered through two different government ministries. One funds research through universities, and the other manages the resources and monitors mitigation by the private sector through the planning system paid for by developers. Thus, deregulated countries have two archaeology professions which rely on different funding and different principles and don't talk to each other. Let's stay with the deregulated system because although it is in the minority among governments in the world, there is a strong possibility that it will eventually inherit the earth. The basic control mechanism is still to treat cultural resources as property something for which there is already plenty of an analogous legislation. <clears throat> Cultural property is property belonging to a nation, like its battleships, to be protected unless the government wants to use it for something, the government being synonymous with the nation. Early legislation in UK and USA focused on drawing up lists or schedules of these properties, and then from the 70s began to add prescriptions for dealing with their loss through looting and development. In 1966, the US government passed the National Historic Preservation Act with a National Register of Historic Places. The site was placed on the register if it had historic significance and vice versa. Section 106 of the Act provided for conservation by recording of any site that could be shown to be significant at the expense of the site's developer. The Act is administered by each state through a State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO. 
it took uh, the United Kingdom another 25 years to catch up with this idea, except that they did not introduce shippers in 1990 when they introduced PPG-16, which is a pity, since compared with county archaeologists, shippers have considerable control over the development process and the quality of work. In 1990, with the introduction of NAGPRA to the United States, they took a major step in recognising the right of descendant communities to reclaim and dispose of human remains in their ancestral territories, appointing TRIPOs, Tribal Preservation Offices, to oversee fair play. Now this legislative package drives the whole enormous CRM industry in the USA. Thus the activity is known as uh, section 106 archaeology or compliance archaeology and, and so forth. Such prescriptions paralleled in many countries serve public interests in a particular way. They start from a recognition of physical assets standing or buried and treat them as resources to be managed. The two main preoccupations of management are the protection or conservation of the assets for the future, and mitigation, the recording of the assets when they have to be sacrificed in the name of social or economic progress. As in the USA, so in other countries, this legislation underpins the greater part of all archaeological investigation. The proportion of archaeologists living off mitigation projects in the USA is now 80% or more of the total people who practice archaeology. It's extremely important that we understand what kind of archaeology gets done as a result of this. It can be seen that the logic of manage, protect and mitigate is not that of our demonstrators on the streets who wanted knowledge, not cultural property. Nor is it what most archaeologists themselves want out of archaeology. They too are in it to know more. There is thus a contradiction between what archaeologists want to do and the economic justification for paying them. Now, this is important if inconvenient. Archaeologists generally begin as volunteers or students, unpaid but well fed and looked after by staff who train and cosset them. They get to have responsibilities, often very early, and are party to the design and the subsequent interpretations of decisions on site on a daily basis. A small fraction of these students go on to become university lecturers and so go on thinking that archaeology is always like that. Lots of fun, booze, sex and trowling. <laughs> However, of those that stay in the business, the vast majority go into government or commercial outfits, the CRM sector. The activities of CRM archaeologists depend on who is paying them to do what, something that many prefer to forget. There are three main ways of being paid to do archaeology outside the university, as a government employee, as conscripted labour, and as an employee in a private company contracted to do the work. Government employees work in archaeology and for archaeology, but within the legislation that employs them. Thus, they did once excavate, but now do a lot of administration and cause excavations to happen or prevent them. In the early days of mitigation, the government paid for field archaeologists through conscription schemes. Famously, under the WPA, or Work Program Administration, Tennessee Valley Authority in the 1930s used a mass of conscript labour to excavate sites which were threatened by dam construction. The director of the whole project was William Webb, a physics professor, who devised schemes of recording that reported findings in a standardised scientific way and established the feature as the primary unit of archaeological significance. The success of this project led to others. The Missouri River Basin Programme, for example, recorded more historic sequence in advance of flooding after the war. Governments also noted this was a handy way of dealing with unemployment, so it has been reactivated in various ways since then. Like many others in the 70s and 80s, I ran manpower services schemes. 
uh, here they are, uh, digging at uh, Waspeton, and youth opportunity programmes. And here they are, uh, working at Stafford. And here they are on a winter morning, <laughs> being hardy. Now these, uh, this is a Stafford project, interesting enough, of three large area excavations were successfully done between te by teens who were all under 18 years old. Probably not even legal to have them on the site now. <laughs> Nearly all commercial field archaeologists nowadays work for companies and have an uncertain sense of their status, if we are to judge by recent literature. The recurrent loans are lack of security, lack of career structure, lack of respect, and lack of money. This does not make for a very creative industry. Let's look at two recent manifesto statements. In their American Antiquity article of 2003, Ian Hodder and Orsa Bergren focus on the lack of academic status of field workers who suffer by being separated from their universities and have no voice in the interpretation of the site. They see this as descendant from the old antiquity labourer system and blame the class system then and now. The solution is reflexive archaeology, a rubric which covers the recording of individual contexts and the construction and promulgation of individual site narratives or monologues. To quote them, reflexive archaeology provides systematic opportunities for field archaeologists to engage in narrative construction and to provide critique of those narratives in relation to data and social context. That's all crystal clear. The act of observation and recording is portrayed as demeaning, and the act of interpretation as uplifting. Quote, the old theoretical debate about the separation between data and interpretation in archaeology partly has a social basis. It is not an abstract philosophical discussion. It is about who is empowered to interpret. And on the whole, the answer has been not the excavator. Well, lack of logic is not a concern for these authors, <laughs> <laughs> whose report appears to emanate from the planet Zog. <laughs> Commercial projects are not supervised by academics, so academics can hardly be the cause of schisms inside a site crew. In science, there is as much kudos in being at the work face in the lab as in designing and supervising projects and the idea that the outcome is not shared is laughable. I'm glad I escaped working on these chilling projects in which people cannot talk to each other on social grounds, but I suspect they are largely fantasy. A modern site crew is not structured by the class system or by any cutthroat competition to write up, be quite nice if it was really, <laughs> or by the recording system, but by the broader socioeconomic context having not enough time, as in contract archaeology, and having too much, as in university archaeology, are equally damaging to precision and clear thought. Teams react as teams to the challenge. Of course, there are overbearing directors, but they're not all made equally obnoxious by some imaginary force of social evolution. Suddenly, we are being advised by not just by Bergen and Hodder, but by Andrews, John Barrett, John Lewis, and so on, to monitor our records some 30 years after we were advised to stop doing it and dispense with our big black site books, Polaroids, and video cameras, the purpose of which was exactly that, in favour of pro forma recording. Happily, not everyone did abandon the business of recording the recording, and some of us took pains to make sure it happened by including it in the design, for example, by using the recovery levels. So on my excavation, both rescue and research, which Ian Hodder had the misfortune to miss, interpretation always started at the trial's edge, often prematurely. In fact, it was a job to get people to shut up. <laughs> Narrative construction went on day and night, <laughs> much of it fatuous, <laughs> but, but some, some truly determined. Sorry, that's the, that's the class system, in case you want to know what it was. <laughs> Now, the reason for this, 
was that we didn't use labourers, but volunteer students and professionals with degrees who had a strong interest in the outcome. No one was going to deny that interest. When we used YOP and MSc teams, on the other hand, the situation was entirely different. Although paid much more than volunteers or students, they requested very clear instructions on an hourly basis and begged to be excused from writing anything at all. Paul Everall's recent review of British commercial archaeology, um, entitled The Invisible Diggers, also raised the spectre of class. But it is at least based on data in the form of questionnaires filled in by employees. This process of itself encourages complaint. So we shouldn't be too surprised if complaint is the main burden of the British profession. And as a reviewer commented in antiquity, they are really quite good at it. 77% of Everall's interviewees thought that the profession was in crisis and that the current system must be changed. They objected to low status and low pay, saying site staff felt they were not treated as specialists, but often merely as labourers. They felt that standards on site had deteriorated since the 1980s and 90s, largely due to poor supervision and inadequate training. Some complained about things that had attracted them in the first place, such as digging and being outdoors in all weathers. But the key finding for me was that a majority of the people who were so fed up that they were considering leaving the profession were doing so because they felt they were losing their love of archaeology. Everill's recommendations are to improve training in the universities and in post and to raise pay. Sure, but how? In this well-meant and incidentally well-written thesis, the profession nevertheless comes across as a beast gnawing at its own wound. Its anxieties and wrongs are attributed only to those near at hand. It is a voice from deep within a trench. But let's note, every one of these complaints, all of them worthy, can be attributed to the same root cause, which has nothing to do with class, evil employers, or reflexivity. It's all about money. In archaeology, as in the rest of the world, you are paid to do what is wanted, not to do what you would rather be doing. As in any other business, the relations of production are not caused by some inherent human nastiness, but the job, the task in hand, and the money available. In the university sector, archaeologists are paid to research and teach and assessed on their publications and performance. In the CRM sector, archaeologists are paid to manage the resource, record it before destruction, and make it accessible to the public. So, that, that's just a, a, a sight of, the, of, of, the, of Everall's victim, of the, the British archaeologist at work. So, there are two parallel parts to our profession. People paid to produce new research, mainly in universities, and people paid to manage research resources, mainly in government underpinned by a large commercial sector. Inevitably, they aim for different outcomes because they serve different masters and their rules of engagement are determined by different government ministries. Could they be brought together as one discipline? Well, now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the commercial profession, not just because that's where the complaints are, but because it is also where most of the archaeological talent goes. It is a talent that is largely untapped, essentially because it is being asked to do the wrong job in the wrong way. That doesn't mean the universities are perfect. They've got a problem with archaeological fieldwork too. It is generally low standard and done without any recognition of their obligations to conservation and cultural resource management. And particularly, the universities are not making enough use of the professional sector to carry out their research. But if we can reposition the work that is done in the commercial sector, make it more satisfying to its employees, give it higher status in the eyes of the brother industries in the development uh, sector, and spend more on it, then much will follow. 
the work we do in the commercial sector will be seen as having equal kudos as that done in the university sector. And then the gap between them can close. The money in the commercial sector comes from developers who are obliged by the planning process to pay for archaeological intervention. They are obliged by their shareholders to pay as little as possible. They are not obliged to provide satisfaction and happiness for the archaeological workforce. The system they use, competitive tender, was borrowed from the USA, but without the shippos, which would have moderated it and kept up the price. Competitive tender causes everything else. No pay, insecure supervisors, lack of training time, lack of status, loss of intellectual content. Developers pay for a site to be cleared, foundations to be laid and a building to be put up. The plans are put together in a design which includes some creative specialists such as the architects and performers such as the masons and suppliers such as those that provide the cement. These are each employed on a different basis. The architect through design competition or direct appointment, the builders and suppliers through tender. The overall price is negotiated with the aid of consultants, quality control agents, planners and accountants. So where are the archaeologists in all this? Well, at first they were nowhere. A bunch of gypsies obstinately refusing to leave the site and muttering about capitalists. I should know. I was one of them. <laughs> then regional trusts began to negotiate a price through the county archaeologists. Then, after Jeff Wainwright had ushered in competitive tender via the newly created English heritage, the price began to be driven downwards. Latterly, developers have appointed their own archaeological consultants to ensure they are not being taken for a ride. These new kids on the block with their fast cars and blackberries are assuming control of the archaeological mitigation process, but not necessarily for its benefit. If this has resulted in any change of status, it is only marginal. Already in the 70s in the USA, the Society of Professional, for Professional Archaeologists had attempted to raise the negotiating position of archaeologist to that of architect. We should be appointed by design competition, they said, and we should negotiate a price appropriate to the job in hand. This was tested in the courts, and so perhaps to defend their action. The archaeologists lost. The procurement of archaeology in the judgment of the judge was no different to the procurement of gravel and should be commissioned through competitive tender. Now, I think it's worth following this trail where it leads, since we are talking here about the backbone of our profession, and it is in no one's interest that they should be disaffected. On one thing, we can all have common cause. The standard of fieldwork must improve. Its scientific repertoire must expand, and its outcome must be more imaginative. And we must be more highly valued. But how? Well, let's first examine how values are arrived at, and then how we could profile ours to attract a more realistic level of support. As we saw earlier, traditional legislation treats our assets as cultural property, beni culturali, property belonging to a state or a person, which although not yet seen, nonetheless has value. The archives of the soil, as the French call it, are like deposits of precious metal, usually seen as the prerogative of the crown. It was this background that led English governments to embrace the ideas of public obligation from treasure trove and preservation by record. According to PBG 16, deposits of national importance were to be kept or excavated where they couldn't be. Meanwhile, in the USA, these deposits were said to have significance rather than importance, suggesting that their meaning was valued above their sense of property. The Section 106 logic led to significant sites being worthy of investigation, while the PBG 16 logic meant that important sites were to be conserved and the others presumably unimportant, were to be investigated. So we thus have two concepts to disentangle. First, does the value of archaeological strata lie in being a monument or in giving knowledge? And second, if knowledge, what sort of knowledge? And what should our response be to the destruction of archaeological sites? In other words, what does mitigation really mean 
and how much should it cost? The malaise of our workforce, in England anyway, implies that archaeology is undervalued by society. How, how could that value be raised? Is there a common value of the past for all people on the earth? If our subject exists as a legitimate and productive human activity, then there must be. Like poetry and chemistry, the inquiry is to do with being human and sharing the planet. We may do it in different ways, but our objectives should be the same. <coughs> or should they? We can see that the 92 elements of the periodic table are shared concepts and that no community can have 93 because of its beliefs. Potassium has similar pro properties in Beijing, New York, Botswana, in Aboriginal Australia, and indeed on Mars. But is this true of the past? Is each community entitled to its own version of the past, not only different from that of outsiders, but morally superior? This is the basis of the postmodern stance which has affected the archaeological project, and in particular the scientific inquiry that I was stressing this morning. The most vocal supporters of this kind of extreme relativism are paradoxically Westerners and many of the leading lights in the World Archaeological Congress. It's not difficult to see why this is. These scholars have worked in political situations that have convinced them that morality is more important than academy. Being entitled to respect is adequate for most of us but not always for the self-appointed champions of descendant communities who can give an unfortunate impression that these communities do not themselves understand what is at stake. Thus the subject is locked in another dogma, and once again the key that unlocks the impasse is design. Every community is used to arriving at decisions via debate, which is another way of describing the design process. In other words, giving a site value is not a case of one argument prevailing <coughs> against the others. It's the net result of, of reconciling different interests. For me, the resolution of value on which the archaeological resource and a whole industry depends is a conciliatory and not an adversarial process. The idea of multivocality is an excellent one, but only if the multivocality is sought when it can have an effect on the outcome, i.e., before a project starts. That is why I think that it is not only essential to have a project design, but to publish it in advance in order to reach all interested parties, not just the ones you'd like to hear from. Everyone should have a say on where an aeroplane is to fly, but once it takes off, there are limited social advantages in having all the passengers in the cockpit. <laughs> Consultation is followed by expertise. This is essentially the same principle as seeking planning permission, and this might indeed be a useful way of seeking consensus for both research and mitigation projects, particularly excavation. My 1996 uh, paper on archaeological value tried to show where archaeology fits in the matters that society finds precious. Here are the main categories of value which planners have to wrestle with when deciding what to do with a piece of land. Market values include ways of creating wealth and are measured in profit, i.e. shopping mall. Community values include the creation of amenities for public benefit or minority benefit and are measured in votes, for example, a school or a hospital. Human values can't be measured in votes or money because they mainly benefit the unborn who don't have votes or money. But we know we want to do our best for them, and archaeology belongs there. This does not assume that there is only one archaeological value, the Western or scientific type. It just assumes that archaeological value, as opposed to any other type, has an intellectual, not a financial, cultural, political, or sentimental reward. Others can fight their corners for these. An intellectual asset can be constructed locally. It does not need to conform to a global agenda, but it may. These ideas urge us to regard the archaeological resource as a source of new knowledge. These resources are not monuments. Some can be made into monuments, but the monument is what you have left when the knowledge has been won. Knowledge is the fruit, the monument is the peel. 
plus the redevelopment of a piece of real estate, which is going to damage the archaeological deposits, is an opportunity for research. The destruction is mitigated by new knowledge, not by preservation by record. The management of cultural resources is a management of research resources, which should be protected or conserved according to the opinion, obviously, of researchers. The fact that many of us have been saying this for 30 years doesn't make it any less true. So, are we making progress? I want to cite very briefly four recent initiatives which seem to me to open paths to new opportunities and raise new hope. These are from Ireland, Sweden, the USA and England. Forgive me if I illustrate these with quotations, but I want to persuade you that I'm not relying on assertion or impression, but quoting from real authorities, which can be used in negotiation by today's field workers to improve their lot and the status of archaeology in general. The USA has had the longest experience of running a deregulated system and has the concept of a knowledge value built into its term of significance. Let's visit ACRA, the American Cultural Resources Association, which was established in 1995 to self-regulate the multi-million dollar CRM industry in the USA, and more importantly, to lobby other participants in the development game. It styles itself a trade association, quote, covering the fields of historic preservation, history, archaeology, architectural history, historical architecture, and landscape architecture. Its aim is to, quote, promote professional, ethical, and business practices for the benefit of the resources, the public, and the members of the association. ACRA lists its responsibilities to the public, to its clients, to its employees, and to its colleagues. Members shall put conservation first, shall strive to respect the concerns of people whose histories and or resources are the subject of cultural resource investigation, and shall not make exaggerated, misleading, or unwarranted statements about their work. They are obligated to provide diligent, creative, honest and competent services and professional advice to their clients. They undertake to exercise independent professional judgment on behalf of their clients, but at the same time they undertake to respect their confidentiality and will accept the decisions of a client concerning the objectives and nature of the professional services unless those decisions involve conduct that is illegal or inconsistent with the ACRA members' obligations to the public interest. Now, this might seem like quite a balancing act, given that the client is a developer and primarily interested in building a new road or putting up a new building, rather than adding another few footnotes to history. But a declared list of mutually supported obligations of this kind, in my opinion, makes it easier to win respect from cooperation, cooperating professions and harder for clients to get work done on the cheap. The assumption here is that archaeological knowledge from research paid for by a developer is the product. Thus, while competitive tender still applies, the status of an ACRA company allows some latitude for negotiated costs with quality control delivered by the shipper. To try and improve their research dividend from rescue, Irish archaeologists got together in 2006 to address the schism in Irish archaeology, as they saw it, with a collaborative policy document called 2020, subtitled Repositioning Irish Archaeology in the Knowledge Society. They sketched the brave new world of the 21st century profession, with its massive increase in archaeologists working in the commercial sector. They noted that government had failed to keep up with this, having no coherent structural policy. They regretted the disconnectedness between development-led archaeology and research between the commercial sector and the universities. The failure to create and publish new knowledge from this massive investment and to provide for archiving and storage. So this came out of a, basically a meeting between Irish archaeologists who were all working in different sectors but knew each other. They'd all been at university together, 
so it wasn't difficult to get them into the same pub. They asked for three overarching enabling measures to be put into force without delay. First, an archaeological implementation partnership, which is a kind of public-private committee that would decide on what was to happen on big projects. So instead of leaving it to competitive tender, they decided to lay out a research minimum for the job. A bureau for archaeological publication to tackle the backlog, create archives, and to underwrite publication. And then thirdly, an inter-institutional collaborative research funding system, which drew attention to the fact that almost alone in Europe, Ireland and Britain had virtually no collaborative procedure between the universities and the consultancy sector, alone in Europe. It's Britain and Ireland that have this problem. They would prime cooperation by setting up a fund of five million euro per year to work on big projects. So their solution was basically find some money, give it to a committee and hope it will work. Now, insofar as any of this has happened, it had not noticeably closed the gap between the universities and the consultants by the time of the 2008 banking crisis, which affected both. But if we were allowed another clear run at the future, some mechanism to encourage the sectors to work together is clearly essential. It may not be best done through government or through a quango. That, that just creates a kind of proxy state archaeological service with no funding. Better is to look at how procurement itself could be modified to give research and knowledge creation greater prominence mission. Sweden attempted to build research into the procurement process by amending its laws in its Proposition 177 of 1994, the Swedish government decided that CRM mitigation was in need of a more visible research dividend, and that every project commissioned by a developer should be seen to be part of a progressive research process. Collaboration between the universities and commercial companies would be closer, and the companies should feel themselves part an integral part of the national research network. In 2006, another Swedish government paper looked towards the uh, heritage management of the future. It should enable the landscape to tell stories. It asks for the humanistic and historical aspects of the historic environment to be strengthened and internationalized. It warned that the increase of archaeological actors in the marketplace would lead to the commercialization of the subject and affect how it is rated. It wanted better links between the research and practical parts of the profession, i.e. the universities and commercial sector. It urged a more open, more international and more offensive, I don't know quite what they meant by that, offensive approach to heritage management, I think more energetic approach to heritage management. These statements are always rather oracular. It gives them longer bureaucratic life, I suppose. But here I've lined up the three main recommendations quoted verbatim with what I think they imply. In general, a loosening up of the government grip in favour of a more frontline role for her heritage in the, in the economy. But it is actually in the UK where we can welcome with some excitement a new awareness of what archaeology is for and why it should be paid for. Curiously, although one of these, PPS 5, is from government, another, which preceded it, came out of the building industry itself. I'm going to look at that one first. Sequel, which appeared in 2006, is the Civil Engineering Quality Assessment and Awards Scheme. It's managed by a private company initiated by the Institute of Civil Engineers. Engineering companies submit projects which are assessed by SQL on their economic, environmental and social success. Projects are scored, not to 10, under a long list of headings and winners get awards. Success indicates an ability to push through a sustainable development in conformity with government policy. This clearly helps win new contracts and thus appeals to self-interest. 
Section 5, which is one of the longest, deals with the historic environment. Evidence, <clears throat> in this case, <coughs> just sort of summarise some of the questions on the, on the right there and, and said how many points you get if you, if you could answer these questions. Evidence should establish how the project has positively protected any historic environment assets. How good design has enhanced and valued the historic environment. How any innovative methods or collaborations have enabled the conservation of historic environment assets. And how any archaeological investigation or building recording have contributed to local and national research agendas. Other sections deal with post-excavation, liaison with local archaeology societies and public access to the site. This document, prepared by the engineering profession, is thus more persuaded of archaeology's value as a generator of new knowledge than most governments or even the archaeology profession itself. All that's needed to upgrade the archaeologist's seat at the table is an agreement by the government and the profession that this is what we do. So finally, to the new PPS 5 uh, issued uh, for England a few weeks ago, uh, do we see any sign here of a change in the official view? Yes, I think we do. PPS 5 defines archaeological resources like this. Those parts of the historic environment that have significance because of their historic, archaeological, architectural or artistic interest are called heritage assets. Some heritage assets possess a level of interest that justifies designation. Archaeological value is here replaced by archaeological interest, defined as an interest in carrying out an expert investigation at some point in the future into the evidence a heritage asset may hold for past human activity. Very neat. Now that encapsulates the idea that what we're preserving under the ground is more resources for research. In other words, they're not being treated anymore as monuments. So far, so good. Among the government's objectives in planning for the historic environment are, quote, to contribute to our knowledge and understanding of our past by ensuring that opportunities are taken to capture evidence from the historic environment and to make this publicly available, particularly where a heritage asset is to be lost. This is a massive improvement on PPG 16. Other aspects to be welcomed are that developers must put the evaluation in the public domain and are required to publish any mitigating excavations they fund. The developers are obliged to release their confidential documents and place them in the public domain. Now, this hasn't happened before. The basic response to a threatened site is still the same, of course. A planning application requires an archaeological evaluation based on desktop assessment and field evaluation where necessary. And the balance is sort of still in favour of preservation. Quote, a documentary record of our past is not as valuable as retaining the heritage asset. Therefore, the ability to record evidence of our past should not be a factor in deciding whether a proposal that would result in a heritage asset's destruction should be given consent. Well, if you followed all that, it's a direct response to what some of us were, 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 were trying to put forward, which was the idea that planning permission should be given on the grounds of a promising research outcome. And uh, they like that, so that, that's, that counters that. A documentary record is, of course, much less than an archaeological research project, but this document stops short of implying that excavation for research purposes increases the significance, not only of that asset, but of the neighbouring sites. So, and you can see why this would, would create a certain amount of anxiety. In this case, research at one site would raise the significance of all its neighbours, inviting their protection. But another is more simple, but less rational. Research is still the business of another ministry. Archaeology in England is the business of culture, media and sport. Paragraph 134 of the Historic Environment Planning Practice Guide, which goes with PPS 5, itemises the content of a written scheme of investigation in 13 paragraphs. And this is very close to the spirit and matter of project design, including 
publication. For projects that are, be, are to be paid for by English Heritage itself, much more detailed guidance is given by MORTH, Management of Research Projects in the Historic Environment. And this replaces the more reactive MAP2. And it flies the research flag, not only in its title, but in its list of good practices. The first of which is the creation of knowledge. Also, under MORPH, project design is led by a project proposal, which is also paid for, so that a company has a chance to bid for work without incurring large costs. By the same token, if the project is accepted, it can be paid to develop the project design. This is all excellent, very excellent idea. Obviously, the intention is that archaeological projects funded by developers should follow a similar ethos and procedure. In other words, a developer should choose a contractor, ask them to develop a project design, have that project design looked at publicly, have it adjusted by other archaeologists, have it looked at by the public as well as the planners, and then return to the developers and say, here it is, and this is what it's going to cost. Thus, in spite of the paradox that archaeology is still in the wrong ministry, English heritage has succeeded in moving a long way towards the idea that the past exists as something to be known rather than something simply to be kept, and would seem to support the concept of archaeology as a fundamental human value, more important than a community value or a market value. So is the argument one. Well, we'll have to wait a bit to see what kind of impact PPS5 has but I fear it will only have an impact in England. It does not tackle the question of competitive tender or price. So in some ways, it is asking for a research frill pasted on rather than a research objectives forcing the pace and determining the degree of intervention and the price. It doesn't tackle the question of quality control, which is crucial at a time of declining standards. Neither the public, nor the developers, nor the media has any mechanism for distinguishing a good excavation from a bad one. As a final pointer to the direction in which archaeological procurement should be heading, we can look at the manifesto published as the government's statement on the historic environment for England. Let's see how far it addresses the questions with which I began. What is archaeological investigation for? Who wants it? Heritage is gone and replaced by historic environment. This doesn't sound too optimistic, since an environment is some sort of static wrap, something you want to keep for various reasons, nostalgic or sentimental, good for votes or economic, it's good for tourism. But it turns out that the British government at least gives a strong steer towards the idea that historic environment only has a meaning if it is powered by archaeological research. That's why it supports the steering of funds towards research projects that, quote, explore our past. And there are some on the right there. It highlights policies that have been implemented already and the success they have had. The Heritage Lottery Fund has been able to support 30,000 projects at a cost of £4.3 billion. The aggregates levy provided about 30 million including a significant contribution to archaeological research. And this is the, the main one. As a major funder of archaeology, the commercial development sector has also contributed to important research. So it's appeared for the first time in a government policy, not as something that has to happen because it's the best we can do, but something that's part of the national strategy for increasing the sum of knowledge. Stockman also recognises that the historic environment is a wealth creator in that people at home and abroad take it as a reason why they travel. For many, heritage has become an increasingly popular leisure, act uh, leisure time activity, it says. It says around 70% of all adults make an active choice to visit historic places every year. 70% of all adults, I don't know where they get that from, but it's a most impressive figure. In other words, like PPS5, this document takes conservation as a given, but realises that without access, there can be no inclusivity. And without curiosity, there's nothing to inspire access. And research is just 
curiosity on its best behaviour. All this talk of research makes the glaring omission that there is more glaring still. What has happened to the universities in these documents? The elephant is not in the room, it's not even on the same island. <laughs> we shall have to return to this problem and my next talk will provide us with an opportunity for, for the moment we can just note that the reason is no doubt the same reason as always. These papers are issued by DCMS and the universities are in a different ministry, they're in DES. Yet DCMS does do research and DES does do ethical uh, practice. Can we conceive of a policy on the environment, on engineering, on geological exploration, exploration which doesn't mention the universities? Why is it just us? <coughs> Research, at least the way that real field archaeologists do it, is itself the basis for the interest in the past that powers the historic environment. And research is what universities do. Well, other countries do it differently, and we'll see a few of those tomorrow. Universities are, in many cases, the only contractors for commercial archaeology. In some cases, they are the partners. But in no country known to me are they left out completely from the process of managing the historic environment. For all that, let's now congratulate English Heritage and DCMS for going with the flow of the profession and showing that research is the lifeblood of our subject. Archaeological investigation is socially embedded, <coughs> supplies society with something it didn't have before, new knowledge, new stories, and does so under a social contract. If the archaeology can be thought of, as English Heritage and the British government apparently now do, as giving added value to the development project as a whole, then the archaeologist comes into the development project as a creative agent, like the architect, rather than a supplier of services or gravel. In this case, archaeologists can be chosen on the basis of the new past they can create, not on the basis of how cheap and pliable they are. And everything else follows. Higher price, higher kudos, greater job satisfaction, and indeed, some sort of a career structure at last. This is not just desirable, but essential. In my last talk, I tried to persuade you that we are, in general, performing field archaeology at many levels below its potential capacity and competence. In this one, that while archaeologists respect the social context in which they work, it's not clear that society gives reciprocal respect to the archaeology we do. In the next lecture, I want to show how that respect can be earned. It brings together our objectives, the study of deposits, and the appreciation of the social context into one integrated whole, the design process. Thank you.